Welcome everyone to today's event, Science and Technology, Sustainable Development and Biodiversity, presented by SG Innovate and Japan Science and Technology Agency, or JST. I am Zing from SG Innovate, and if you're new to us, we are a government-owned organization in Singapore with the mission to build deep tech innovations from Singapore for the world. We invest in and help build deep tech startups in the fields of artificial intelligence, med tech, and content tech, just to name a few. We work with entrepreneurial scientists and clinicians to help bring their innovative research from lab to market. And we also develop talents and engage with a vibrant deep tech ecosystem. Today, we are very proud to be working with Japan Science and Technology Agency to have our first biodiversity event with a focus on innovative science in the area, as well as efforts to promote sustainable development, something that is essential to all and is part of what SG Innovate hopes to do, which is improving, life, which is improving the life of all. Just some house rules during the webinar. If you have any questions, please post them during the uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And do feel free to use the chat box to connect with our wider community. Before we begin, let me hand over the time to Amy Kaneko, Director of JST Singapore Office and our moderator for the day to share more about JST. Amy. Okay, thank you very much, Zuin, for the introduction. So thank you all for attending today's seminar. I'm Amy Kaneko, Director of Singapore Office of Japan Science and Technology Agency, or JST in short. JST is a funding agency which supports research activities and social application of research outcomes in Japan. This is the fifth uh, webinar we're organizing with SG Innovate, and the first one in the theme of biodiversity. Biodiversity may not be such a familiar topic in this SG Innovate community, but I saw a letter from a reader of Singapore, Singapore's local newspaper, Street Times, okay, yesterday, saying that uh, get more people interested in Singapore's biodiversity. This letter appreciates the rich biodiversity in Singapore, which you can still observe in specific areas in this highly urbanized city as well as urge people to participate in activities conducted by entities like Nature Society Singapore. This is why I think today's topic is re very uh, re relevant. As Dr. Sean Lam, one of our speakers here is the president of Nature Society Singapore, and he will be able to navigate us through biodiversity in Singapore and the wider region. The three other speakers, Professor Kanzaki, Dr. Masteria, and uh, Mr. Fukuhara, are related to a JST uh, supported research project uh, called Japan ASEAN Science and Technology and Innovation Platform, or JASTIP. Biodiversity is an integral part of JASTIP, so the talks are going to be very exciting. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Uh, our first speaker, Mr. Ryuichi Fukuhara. He's the program director of JASTIP, led by Kyoto University in collaboration with the research institutions in Japan and the ASEAN member states, as well as ASEAN Committee of Science and Technology and Innovation. His talk title is Introduction of Japan ASEAN Te Science and Technology and Innovation Platform, JASTIP, for sustainable development. Mr. Fukuhara, please. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction to Ms. Kaneko, to Singapore, director of the Singapore office, JST. And I'm, I'm Ryuichi Fukuhara, program coordinator of JASTIP. Already she introduced that it stands for the Japan ASEAN Science Technology Innovation Platform for Sustainable Development since 2015. And I will briefly in, introduce our program and to, to follow up the, the topics of the, of the following speakers. Yep. 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 Then let me start with my presentation, my introduction with a, with a brief history of the Bank of Machine. You, some of you, you may know about this famous antibiotics. Under the antibiotic, 
biotech discovery program by pharmaceutical company in the Eli Lilly in 1950s, vancomycin was discovered, developed, isolated from the soil, sample sent to the Eli Lilly in the Borneo in almost, almost 50 years ago. And I think here is the two points when we consider about the biodiversity, conservation and the utilization in the region in Southeast Asia. あ、すいません。はい。いや。で、ヒアトゥポイントアイシンク。イズイズオッケー。イエス。ウィキンシーアスライス。いや。ワイト。イン1950s。リルキャパシティオブ to develop the new antibiotics because of you in, the, in, in Singapore, in the Indonesia, in the other ASEAN member states couldn't, didn't have a, you, the capacity to utilize the biodiversity. That's why in the, it, it was just sent to the labo of the pharmaceutical company in the West. And the second point is that there are no right, no direct benefit to the country of the origin of the genetic resources from the biodiversity. But now that, including the Singapore and Indonesia and Thailand, some other member states have the technological capacity. And also you, now we have, we have to follow the Nagoya protocol for access and benefit sharing for genetic sharing. But it means the conservation and the utilization of the biodiversity for a key to sustainable development of the region for each as already presented. So based on these backgrounds, just deep started since 2015, because Japan implemented so many international collaboration, collaboration projects in the region, but most of them are research for research, but we have to transform our our focus for research for making societal impact to achieving the sustainable development goal. And also the, so far we like a pre planting trees, but we, we want to create the so-called in, the innovation forest in which new idea, new, new research, new, new find, findings come up through the collaborations. Then, then, then as the Ms. Kaneko introduced, funded by JST, we, Kyoto University, start to implement Japan Science, Technology and Innovation Platform program in 2015. And we just closed the first phase, the August 2020, then the last month, no. In September, from September, we started the second phase for coming four years and a half. Here the mission of the JASTIP, the promote Japan ASEAN Research Collaboration for Sustainable Development. And also we'd like to increase visibility and the credibility of the Japan and ASEAN collaboration in science, technology, and innovations. And not only the collaboration among the researchers, we we'd also would like to promote multi-stakeholder involvement to make more social, in, social impact of the research outcomes. And also if we want to make our platform sustainable. This is necessary to, to build the capacity of the next generation of human resources in Japan and ASEAN. But having said that, we couldn't cover the all science, all research area on the STI. So we picked up the three areas. The first one is the energy and the environment. The second one is the biomaterials and biodiversity that today's main theme. And also the last one is the 
disaster risk reduction and prevention. This is also the common issue between uh, Japan and the member states. And each research area closely linked to the SDG goals, as you can see the, the right side of the slide. And not only that, our research foresight are also closely related to the priority area of the ASEAN Committee on Science and Technology and Innovation, like, and uh, then costly there are subcommittees, the biotechnology, the marine science technology, and blah, blah, blah. And we picked up these three areas closely linked in, in our program structures. Also, then, also, this is necessary to coordinate because now the challenges we are facing is not only the solved by the single academic discipline, like, uh, for example, in the today's, when we have to consider sus sustainable uh, bi biodiversity conservation, it is closely linked to the disaster risk reduction, like a, like a slump, like a peace slump fire and the forest fire. And also, if we want to have a, a sustainable energy, we definitely have to rely on the uh, biomass. And it's also kind of the overlapping area between the energy and the biodiversity. And also, we, in, since 2015, we established regional hubs in the ASEAN countries. Energy and the environment are in Thailand, and disaster risk reduction group established a joint laboratory in the MJIIT. And today, uh, the bio resource in the biodiversity group established the LIPI in the Indo Indonesian Sci Institute of Science in Indonesia. And today, also the, the, the speaker from the LIPI. That's all my introduction. And And an excellent following speaker will provide more interesting topics for, for related to the biodiversity. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fujihara. Now it's time for us to welcome Professor Mamoru Kanzaki. He's a professor at Kyoto University and majors in forest ecology. He is one of the co-leaders of JUSTIP and, lead, and is leading the bioresources and biodiversity working package of JUSTIP. In, 19, uh, in 1986, he obtained his Doctor of Science from Osaka City University and started his career as a plant ecologist. After he moved to Kyoto University, his research interests shifted from pure ecology to forest management and local society. Currently, he is interested in the wide, wise use of biodiversity-based products, including genetic resources from uh, forest ecosystems, which will enhance the conservation of tropical forest. His talk title for today is Biodiversity-Based Ecology in ASEAN Countries for the Sustainable Development of the Region. Professor Kanzaki, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Kaneko-san, for your introduction. So I share my file now. Can you see? now yes it's okay hi yes so today's my topic is about the biodiversity based economy but actually i am not an economist i am an ecologist <laughs> but uh, uh this is a self introduction so as kaneko san introduced i my ca research career started from the forest ecology as a forest ecologist. But uh, gradually, I uh, interested in the society and also the sustainable development. And uh, from 2010, I, uh, I started uh, collaboration with JST. The first project is about the tropical rainforest utilization. And uh, after that, 2015, we started the Japan ASEAN Science Technology and Innovation Platform, uh, already Fukuhara-san introduced, JASTIP. So the, today, I, ah, this is a JASTIP, uh, one, 
one part of the JASTI project that the uh, work package three focuses on the biodiversity and the bio resources. So we have three research cluster and also uh, uh, two research cluster and one is uh, dissemination. So we continue the research for the last five years, in, mostly in collaboration with LIPI, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. And today, I want to focus on the biodiversity conservation through wide use of genetic resources, especially the biodiversity. And uh, uh, through this presentation, I would like to introduce our just activity. And also, uh, I want to introduce the more broad uh, structure of the biodiversity utilization in Southeast Asia, ASEAN countries. So the first uh, biodiversity in the ASEAN region, uh, this is a very incredibly rich uh, biodiversity occur here in Southeast Asia, including the continental part of Southeast Asia. So the, there are four uh, region was designated as a hotspot. That is a, a, sorry, I forget, the Conservation International uh, defined the hotspot of biodiversity in the world. And the four photospots uh, are a bit different by ohms there, so separated into four parts. Né? The, mostly we work now in Sunda land, that the Indonesia and the Malaysia uh, Sarawak and Sabah and Brunei. Eh? This is included in Sundaland. And uh, also Indo Burma uh, region, also quite rich in fauna and flora. And uh, most uh, uh, typical uh, symbolic animal and flower is uh, shown here La Fresia and Orang Utan and Rhinos. So the every uh, researchers and every people understand that the Southeast Asia is uh, uh, one of the most richest part of the world in biodiversity. So our just activity uh, researches also focuses on this biodiversity. So this is uh, the uh, exploring the biodiversity on the canopy. So in tropical rainforest, still the canopy area is uh, uh, unexplored part. So our team surveys the biodiversity in the canopy region. But today's my talk is about the uh, utilization of biodiversity. So, so today I would like to uh, show you the, how we can utilize biodiversity for our economy or for our human life and for sustainable development. So the most easy, easy to, most simple way is ecotourism. So here we must conserve the forest or ecosystem for using, to utilize for the ecosystem tourism. So the on-site conservation or in-situ conservation is very important. But research and development for ecotourism is not so big. Uh, investment is necessary. Uh, of course, uh, investment is necessary, but uh, uh, we have no need to spend uh, quite a long time comparing to the drug development. So the next step of the utilization is a local product with traditional knowledge. So we can produce the local product, which have a, a long history in that area and uh, traditional knowledge support this kind of the product. So the next step is the fun functional chemicals and the drugs. So this is the, uh, the the cost of the research and the development will increase if we go from top to down, I think. But the on-site conservation is most important in ecotourism. So actually, agriculture also same, have the same uh, structure uh, from wild strain and new edible plant come from the eco biodiversity and it uh, 
due to the research and development, we can produce a functional food. So agriculture also have a same, very similar structure, but uh, today my talk focuses on this part, tourism, food, and drug. So the ecotourism, everyone know now, so biodiversity and the local knowledge or local people's life is a, a charming point of this tourism. And this is an Indonesian mangrove tourism, tourism site with uh, so many bungalows here, and we can enjoy the nature and mangrove forest. And this is a quite close to many Singaporean visited here, I think, Bintan Mangrove Discovery Day and Night Tour. So the, uh, the guided tour is quite important to understand biodiversity. So this is not uh, like a recre uh, this is not uh, like a sport or uh, just uh, traveling. And uh, the knowledge, scientific knowledge and the traditional knowledge we can absorb and it can be a quite big uh, amusement. And uh, this is uh, uh, combined with uh, ecotourism. Many ecotourism sites have produced a local food or a local product. So this is a, I collected from the internet, which is related to the mangrove. So Indonesian case, okay, here 36 Indonesian mangrove recipe. So the many food using the mangrove uh, animal, uh, mangrove plant and sometimes uh, animals, mostly marine fish and crab and shrimp. And uh, this is a very common species, nipa palm in mangrove forest, or uh, just behind of the mangrove, we have a quite large area of uh, community of uh, uh, stand of the nipa palm. And so the some area, this also from Indonesia, they produce a jam uh, from this fruit. So all a uh, very traditional utilization of mangrove biodiversity, but it can be a, a business. And also the uh, recently the study on the mangrove uh, mangrove plant leaves, uh, we found that the high polyphenol contents of the mangrove trees, especially blues, and uh, the of course. Uh, some area they try to they challenge to produce a, a mangrove leaf tea of course uh, we can use like this but and also the chip the flake of the mangrove leaf mixed with uh, uh, cookies or uh, uh, some food so this kind of the food is also available now in many places of the ecotourism site in uh, which established in mangrove forest. But recently, the other kind of the function of polyphenol uh, was were clarified by Japanese scientists that the uh, mangrove leaf form on the, on the surface of the soil and it decomposed. But uh, it, uh, polyphenol and tannin connected with the uh, uh, iron element in ecosystem and this iron, uh, iron element move to the marine and support the bioproductivity of marine ecosystem. This is a quite new findings, but still the uh, some uh, very hypothetical uh, research, but uh, it's a quite interesting that the mangrove contribute to the marine ecosystem in through the polyphenol function. So this kind of the uh, knowledge also uh, impact to the ecotourist, I think. Okay, so the local product is uh, quite important from now. So already the uh, honey and the propolis became uh, some business, a small, uh, it can be a very common business now. Already, we can see the many propolis product in Amazon uh, website. So the propolis from stingless bee is uh, quite uh, 
unique uh, characteristics. Right? And uh, we, I visited uh, East Kalimantan, Indonesia. Originally, the uh, st stingless bee, uh, they have a nest in the stem of the trees. But the many people now starting the cultivation or uh, rearing the uh, stingless bee. Né? So we, they can produce uh, honey and propolis. I'm sucking the honey from the directly from the uh, nest box. So the, this stingless bee have a quite diverse species. This is a, a slide from, uh, provided by C. Kahono of Ripi and he, 34 species at least in this region, uh, Sundaland, and uh, Wallachia, four species, and uh, in New Guinea, nine species. So the quite diverse honey uh, stingless bee species, and their product also, the quality and the characteristics is so different. So the one of the, uh, sorry, one of the, our research project is about the honey and the propolis function. Uh, this is a, a comparative study of the product from different species and dif different location. And uh, we found that the anti-cancer uh, effect is quite strong, this SP4, number four. Okay? Probably this species, and also the tyrosinase test. It indicates the effect of the reducing the melanin formation. So the quite important for cosmetics, and uh, this SP4 also shows a quite good uh, performance. Né? So this indicator is a uh, lower is better. Né? So SP4 is SP4 is a quite feasible species. Okay, so the we also conducting the uh, functional chemicals assessment, uh, collection and bioassay and isolation and identification. We our focus uh, we focuses on the rubiaceae species and uh, ferns as a, some part of the our uh, plant species in ASEAN region. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, now the, some of the question come that uh, how to protect the stingless bee from the enemy. So that is uh, quite important. So the maintenance of the, this nest box is quite important. Okay. Okay. Okay, so another work is uh, anti malaria. Uh, substances. So artemisin is a quite uh, famous medicine that appeared from the 1980. So the artemisia is uh, this plant, a very common weed plant. If any place in the world we can find out this species, uh, this group. And uh, actually they have uh, some symbiosis with uh, endophyte and microbes. They uh, stay to uh, the microbes in this plant body can uh, modify or combat the artemisinin that produced by the this plant. So the artemisia species there are several species of, of common artemisia and endophytes there are so many endophytes. So combination of these host and uh, symbiosis by uh, microbes can produce uh, many kinds of combated artemisinin. So the artemisinin, uh, sorry, uh, this, uh, we can utilize this kind of the biodiversity. It's a, a symbiosis system we can utilize to uh, detect the new chemicals which related to the RTBC. So this is a diagram. How the new, uh, why the, this kind of the uh, bioprospecting is necessary? Always the new chemicals or main new drug, its effect reducing like this. 
dropping dropping down. So the because of the drug resistance of malaria, okay, chloroquine have a, a cure rate decrease drop down so rapidly until the 1980. And then the uh, uh, sorry, uh, chloroquine, then chloroquine drop out and fancy down, next fancy down. And uh, after that, and the mef uh, mefloquine uh, became a very strong drug, but it's also dropping like this. Né? So artemisinin appeared from the 1980s and uh, it's uh, expand after the 2000 year 2000. So, so always we must produce a new medicine. Okay, so uh, because of time, I will skip this uh, slide, but the uh, utilization of uh, such uh, uh, microbes, uh, we can apply to the industrial process. Okay. Okay, so the, this kind of the uh, biodiversity utilization, uh, we need uh, uh, some mechanism to enhance the, this kind of activity. And uh, this biodiversity uh, utilization must contribute to the area where the biodiversity is supporting. So the very unique and very effective uh, structure uh, mechanism of the biodiversity utilization. I think the one of the mechanism is uh, UNESCO's biosphere reserve. Yeah. We have many biosphere reserve here. In Singapore also, four, four biosphere reserve. Yeah. Maybe Sean will uh, introduce later. So anyway, the protected area and the buffer zone and transition area, we can combine these areas and promote biodiversity utilization. So this is uh, uh, the one of the strong mechanism uh, defined by UNESCO. Yeah? Okay, but as uh, Fukuhara introduced, uh, we must follow access and benefit sharing principles. So the uh, country who produce and who protects the biodiversity must get uh, the benefit from the, such a biodiversity based business. Né? So the, ah, yeah, I think the Singapore uh, is, uh, yeah, Singapore is uh, also tropical countries. Even the island is very small, actually is a, uh, uh, the number of species appeared in Singapore Island is so high. Né? Of course, uh, Indonesia is a mega biodiversity country, so Masseria San will introduce, but uh, I think that even the Singapore, uh, you can utilize uh, your biodiversity. And also Singapore is a can be a hub of the biodiversity development in ASEAN region. So I expect much about the Singapore function in future. Okay, so this is my presentation, all of my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Kanjaki, right. for your very informative presentation. Uh, it's a pity that we cannot travel abroad at this moment in this pandemic, but after we are, uh, we are through it, we are sure to make uh, go abroad, enjoy the biodiversity, patronage, the agricultural products that made from uh, enjoying the biodiversity, right? And you also kindly answered the questions during your presentation. So um, I think we have to move on to the next presentation. But if there are any audience who would like to ask additional questions for, for, for Professor Kanzaki, then they are uh, encouraged to do so by typing in their questions in the Q&A box so that Professor Kanzaki can type, uh, type his replies back. So thank you very much, Professor Kanzaki. Now uh, we'd like to move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Masteria, uh, you know this Laputra, a senior researcher at the Research Center for Biotechnology, Indonesia Institute of Sciences, or LIPI. He earned his master's and uh, PhD degree in my, uh, marine biology and ecology at Mate uh, Polytechnic University, Italy, 
and conducted his research at the Institute for Chemical Chemistry and Biology for Marine Environment, University of Oldenburg, and the Center for Natural Product Drug Discovery and Development, University of Florida. Currently, he's the head of uh, Group Drug Discovery and Development and Research Center for Biotechnology, LIPI. His research group focuses on the uh, research of uh, bioactive molecules for pharmaceutical properties within Indonesia biodiversity. His talk title for today is Chemical Ecology and Natural Product from Indonesian Marine Invertebrates. Dr. Masteria, please go ahead. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Amy Kaneko, for the short, nice uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to all the organizing committee to invite me for this uh, nice symposium and conference. So let me start my uh, presentations today. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> the title of my presentation of today is about marine chemical ecology and natural product from Indonesian marine and vertebrates. So my background of research is combined with the ecology, chemical, and pharmaceutical. So most of my works, uh, 10 years, uh, mostly in uh, marine natural product, especially from marine invertebrates and marine microorganisms. So today I will introduce uh, my research activity. But since uh, this year, my uh, research groups not only work with marine uh, organisms, but we also interesting with uh, plants, organisms, science, herbal medicines, because our research group uh, focusing in uh, drug discovery and developments in Indonesia. So now I work in uh, Indonesian Institute of Science in Research Center for Biotechnology. So as we know that the oceans um, more cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface and contains uh, more than 300,000 species of plants and animals. So macroscopic plants and, have, uh, and animals have adapted to all regions of the oceans and including polar, temperate, tropical areas. And the diversity of species is extraordinary in rich in coral reef. So this is the picture of the coral reefs and most of the auxiliary reach on coral reef in the tropical area. As we can see, so in the age of biologists and ecologists, we look to coral reef in the Asians about fish, gorgonian, mollusca, tunicates, ponds, soft coral, and sediments with microorganisms. But in my perspective to, uh, as a chemist or pharmacist, so we look into the ocean is a uh, chemical compounds. So if you see the history of terrestrial natural products chemistry can be really be traced back to the beginning of 19th century. But this is a really contrast with marine natural products so because established 50 years ago, uh, science we can collect it by scuba diving or by snorkelings. But right now, most of the compounds that collected from the soccer uh, from the marine invertebrate. Some of 10 years ago, so everybody uh, interesting to look the marine microorganism, but associated with the marine, uh, marine uh, invertebrates. So as we look here in the oceans, so we see that the coral reef or uh, marine invertebrates, they are sessile organisms. So if they are growth, they need the competition of space or sometimes the against with some of the predator. So for the several mechanisms, so some of the marine invertebrates or marine sessile organism, they use the chemical compounds because as we can uh, set the chemical difference. So most of the chemical compounds that they use of the marine uh, invertebrates or marine sessile organism could be potential for the new drugs. As we can see here, almost 1.8 percent of the extract from marine animals have shown anti-cancer activity. And that's we compare with uh, terrestrial spread only 0.4 percent of terrestrial plants could be the cytotoxics or for the anti-cancer activity. So that's why we're interesting to look the pharmaceuticals 
a potential in marine environments or marine organisms. So as we can see right now, there is several compounds used in clinic isolated from marine organism. So first of all, this is on the list, the first compound that are the uh, in market for from the marine organism, on the list, it is used for the cancer and now registered from the European and uh, FDA in Americas. And this is really interesting also with conus that we can collect it in, in some of the area, tropical and subtropical. And they have the now compound conotoxins and the compounds and the name of the market secondite. It be used for the anti pain or anti inflammatory. And some of them, from, for example, from the, the spons tetia, so there is a cita, uh, citarabins for use the anti cancers also, and there is a fidarabin also for antivirals. So most of, I think most of, right now, most of 10 or 20 compounds from the marine organism, like macroorganism or microorganism, are in clinical phase, clinical trial or phase one, clinical trial phase one, clinical trial phase two, or some of them is clinical trial phase three. So I hope in later in next year, we have one of the compounds maybe in the market again. And I think this year there is one compound in the marine compound named Lurbinectin already approved for the sarcoma cancers. So as we can see, look in Indonesia, Indonesia is a rich source of biodiversity and comodiversity. So as you know that we are the largest archipelagic country. So we have more than 70,000 islands and 81,000 kilometers of the coastlands. And we are recognized as the richest in the world in terms of diversity of marine organism. So if we compare, uh, compile with the plants and the marine, in, and marine uh, organism, maybe we are the first biodiversity in the world's, uh, after, uh, in the world's compared with the Brazils. So most of them have already collected for, from the marine organisms. Some of them are already collected from the foreign researcher or Indonesian researcher. As you can see that there is Manado peroxide collected from the Manado here, and Biakitide collected from Biak, and Papua Namine collected from the Papua. So if you look at the description of marine organism biological activities, as I, as, I, as, I see, uh, as I said before, most of marine natural products in Indonesia uh, conducted by foreign researcher or collaboration with Indonesian researcher. And most of them is anti-cancer and some of them is antibacterial activity. So this is really interesting from Indonesia and LIPI is aware right now to establish uh, research from marine natural product to look the potential pharmaceutical uh, <clears throat> potential from this marine organism. So this is what my uh, research group uh, working right now. Instead, we're working also with plants. We're also working with marine uh, organisms. So this is the marine natural product industry. So as you can see, first is an all profit drug based on marine spawns, three-fight compound is more than 50 million to 100 million right now. So it could be interesting because some of the most of the compound from marine organism right now focusing for anti-cancer and antibiotic and some of them antiviral. So there is one compound from antivirals, uh, especially for anti-SARS-CoV-2 already phase three clinical trial in Spain, name of the aplidins right now to be clinical trial for the COVID-19. So we have the potential also for the COVID-19 treatment from the marine organisms. So as you can see, for the compare like marine spawns in 10 such country from 2001, 2010. So I think right now in 2020, Indonesia is number one and Japan is the second, I think, because most of them exploits right now for Indonesian spawns. So, what my group's working right now, so we're working about the development of library novel reactive compound from marine origins. So we collected marine or macroorganism from all of the area in Indonesia from Sabang until Merauke. And we also isolated from marine microorganism from this uh, uh, marine microorganism from this marine macroorganism. So we have right now a huge library of novel reactive compounds especially from marine organisms that be collected from several areas in Indonesia. So we have the 
uh, discovery platform in our uh, research group right now. So most of them are working be interesting because marine organisms, if most of them cytotoxic, so we interesting to working anti-cancer. And well, so we also interesting also working with antibacteria, but the first step we start in our lab is to study cytotoxic of these marine macroorganisms. So a phase of expedition, so we collected the microbiology, we tested with anti-tumoral screening, also with cytotoxic cells, so also with the normal cell and so with the cancer cell. Then we look at the mechanism of actions. Then, yeah, if the we start with trying to start the synthesis process, and because synthesis process is really interesting for the pharmaceutical developments, and we start also in vivo assay this year, and we done the clinical human trial data analysis. So we also doing in our group to the clinical trial, especially for COVID nineteen, uh, in collaboration with pharmaceutical company in Indonesia. So this some of marine invertebrates that I will explain in my presentation that we collected in several area in Indonesia. This is Spons yersinia, this is Spons ligeta, and uh, this is Sophora similaria, and this is Sophora sarcoviton, and this is Ashidian polycarpa aurata. This Ashidian is really common. So if you can go to, uh, if you can, if you can do snorkeling, you can uh, see very uh, easy in the. Or 10 or 5 meters by snorkeling these uh, marine ascidians. So what we're looking in, in uh, first I will uh, present about Sinularia. So we, this Sinularia from Sophora is very interesting for us because we are isolated most of actin's uh, compounds and mostly is uh, new compounds. So this is the first compound that we isolated from the marine Sophora Sinularia. So this is type of chambran uh, noid titerpans. So this is uh, the new compound. So we selected three new compounds from Sofcora sinoraria and two non-compound from Sofcora sinoraria. And we tested for the anti-inflammatory also for cytotoxic activity, but most of three new compound is not active for the anti-inflammatory. So then we tested also this compound. We isolated also this compound from Sofcora sinularia. So this is the glycolipid compounds that we isolated from Sofcora sinularia. And one is known compound named Cerebrosidae. And this is new compounds named Sinularosidae. This is very interesting because Sinularosidae is the first compound isolated have the three acetylated uh, ring here. And this is very rare in natural products. Most of them acetylated compound in uh, synthesis acetylations. So two of these compounds, we already tested for anti-inflammatory activity using inducible nosynthesis at the INS protein inhibitory activity. As you can see, this, here's the uh, <clears throat> serial sinularia. It's difference of concentration of sinularia and cerebrida and the production of INS have the first cerebrosida have the moderate activity for INS protein inhibitory. And this scenario have the mild uh, activity uh, in NS protein inhibitory activity. Then we isolated also two uh, new compounds from the software scenario, uh, named as sunolofoxide and sunolofosulfone. This type of the alkaloid compounds, then we tested this compound also for anti-inflammatory. So most of them is this compound have the moderate activity also because in 30 micromolar have the 25% inhibition of NOS productions. And this is very interesting. So most of the sinularia of the soft coral from the uh, genus of Archonegia, they have most of the compound inside them is sterile. And we isolated egg compound from the soft coral sinularia and five of them is the new compound. So we tested this compound with pharnacetoid activated receptor because this pharnacetoid activated receptor has recognized for the treatment of cholestasis and pathological state with occur when bile acid produced. So this is very important in our livers. So if you have the cholestasis disease, so this is very important for us to see the FXR, FXR inhibition. And two of these compounds, this three, the compound X is the most of the uh, 
a major compound or major sterile from the soft coral area, not soft coral area, but also from the soft coral lobovitum or sarcovitum and have the activity for FXR inhibition. And this is really, uh, we start study against uh, this uh, gorgosterol to look the inside how the mechanism of action for X FXR inhibition in this compound gorgosterols. And the next we focusing with marine lucetta. So this compound is uh, distribution in tropical and subtropical area. So this is very tiny of soft uh, sponge. So the color of the yellow and very tiny. So they have uh, two uh, major compounds named lichitamol A and the lichitamol B. And most of them, 6% of, of the garnet extracts from lichitamol A sponge uh, contain the lichitamol A. So we studied this lichitamol A and lichitamol B and we studied semi-synthesis also with acetylation and uh, reductions of this uh, double bond of growth. So we study about the anti-inflammatory also and neuroactive with this lichitamol A and synthesize of the lichitamol A and B. So including with, uh, with TRPA1 and TRPA egg uh, uh, channel. So most of them see that lichitamol A and lichitamol B have the activity from uh, anti-pain or anti-neuroactive uh, compounds. And this is very interesting from the sarcopitone. So as you can see that this sarcopitoxide, A, sarcopitoxide and sarcopin. These two compounds is the major compound from sarcopitones. So sarcopitoxide is the major compound in sarcopitone. And this compound is used as chemical defense against predator in the coral reef for the sarcopitones. So we tested this sarcopitoxide the sarcopitoxide here with the uh, neuroactive and anti-inflammatory using the TRPF3 activating and nf kappa b And this sarcopitoxide and sarcopin show the uh, high activity for the uh, anti-inflammatory and neuroactive. So next, this is polycarpa aurata. So we selected polyaurin A and polyaurin B, and this polyaurin A is impaired X production in vitro schizocotosoma uh, mansoni. So this is very interesting because this is the first compounds in the polycarpa we tested with uh, schizocotosoma mansoni, and this disease is really uh, abundant in Southeast Asia, also in Indonesia and some of area in development country. And this our uh, new paper, so we isolated this Yoshinia sponge. So we collected from the Siribu Islands or Thousands Islands. So we give the name as Siribunamina, Siribunamide, this compound, so to knowledge of Siribu Islands. So we selected two new peptides here and we already test this uh, compounds with the several uh, panel cancer cells, but there is no activity with this new compounds. And our next focusing in Indonesia is Indonesian sea cucumber. So we collected also several uh, species of sea cucumber in Indonesia. I think we already collected more than 51 species. And this 51 species were the tested with cytotoxic, antioxidant, and antibacterial. And we uh, developed a database of Indonesian sea cucumber from classical taxonomy. Some, uh, one of my colleagues already uh, published the book about the Indonesian sea cucumber or tripang. So we started and then our recording for the sea cucumber last year. And my research group working in biological activities and nat a natural product for the sea cucumber. And we tested with cytotoxic using sulforodamines, using that's already been mentioned before, that we tested with uh, four human cancer cells. So, and most of them uh, have the activity for the cytotoxic or, or cancer uh, activity. So we tested with the colons, lung and breast and pancreas uh, cancer cells. And most of them have the activity only two uh, organisms not active from, for anti-cancer from sea cucumber that we collected in Lombok. And we tested again with some of the sea cucumber that we, we collected in Lampung. So most of them also active 
for anti-cancer. So only three compounds not active for this uh, anti-cancer. Maybe that's uh, impact of the environments because some of them we collected in the in the wild environments. Some of we collected from the uh, aquaculture. And we tested also this for chemical study, not only chemical study to look in the non or new compound inside of this cucumber, but we look also the chemotaxonomy of this of this cucumber because in with the chemical compound inside this cucumber, we can understand the species of this cucumber. So as you can see here, so as you see this, the species Holotaria, the genus Holoteria, they always have the compounds of Holoterin A, or they have the compound Holoterin B. And this is the pattern of the chemical compounds in the genus of Holoteria. As you can see here, the Stichopus genus, they have the Sticholoricidae A, or they have the Sticholoricidae C. So this is the pattern compound or the major compound in the Stichopus genus. So we can also identify of this uh, cyclocomb based on chemical taxonomies. We can also identify it based on the DNA recording, but we can also identify it based on the chemical taxonomies of the cyclocomber. I see also here, they have also SEMS, the holoturia also have the holoturin A, and, <coughs> and, and here the, some of them have the actinopia here, also, the, almost the same genus with the whole chair have the holoturin A. So here, the most uh, predicted the new compounds inside this holoturin, inside of the cucumber. And this is the, the, the compound that we already done in cucumber. Most of them holoturin from holoturia cucumber or holoturin B from holoturia cucumber. And this is Sticholoricidae A1 and Sticholoricidae C1 and Sticholoricidae A2 from Stichopus genus. And this uh, some of the data compound from the whole tree. So thank you very much. This of my research group. So we have the young generations in DP, most of them uh, 55 years old. So, so we have still waiting collaboration with any foreign researcher that want to collaborate with us. This is our site of uh, our research group. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Masteria, for your very detailed presentation. Uh, because of the time constraint, I think we can only pick up one question from the Q&A box. The rest of the questions, you please type in your replies, right? Yep. So the question is, in the light of the recent pandemic, do you think that more governments could prioritize drug discovery and development from biological uh, sources rather than ecotourism in the future, in the near future? Can you check the Q&A box with me? Hello. Hello. Dr. Pucha, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, I think he has a problem listening to us. So, uh, I invite Dr. Mastera to reply he, his replies in the Q&A box. Uh, yep. Now, yeah, okay. So, uh, what, uh, there is three or uh, five answers, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, so, I don't have time for all of the questions, so just answer the first one orally, mm. and the rest of the questions you can type in your reply. Yes, uh, in the, so from Hu Ying, so, uh, do you think that more government could prioritize drug discovery and development from biological resource, by biological source rather than ecotourism in the near future? I think because the COVID-19, uh, most of government prioritize to look uh, the pharmaceuticals. Like for example, Indonesia, we are not prioritized for the discovery and development right now. 
But now this our prioritized Indonesia because we're looking our COVID-19, we're looking some herbal medicine in COVID-19. Uh, how can like such as immunomodulator or also we look also antiviral for COVID-19. And this is very important right now to governments aware about the pharmaceuticals uh, in the future. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your question and answering the questions. For the rest of the question, you please type in your replies in the candy box, right? Okay, so thank you very much. And now it's time for us to welcome our last but not least speaker for today, Dr. Sean Lam, President of Nature Society Singapore. He joined the Asian School of the Environmental Environment at Nanyang Technological University in January 2016 after uh, sorry, after spending more than 20 years at, as a lecturer at the National Institute of Education. He completed his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. He was born in Tokyo, raised in Honolulu, and has uh, spent his working career in Singapore. In addition to his teaching and academic work, his work close, he works closely with local environment and nature related agencies and is active in nature conservation NG, NGOs and civil society. He's also a recipient of President Award for the Environment in 2017. Dr. Lam, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Kaneko-san, thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. I also want to give a shout out to Zing from SG Innovate for really putting um, this today's program together and for inviting me along with you, Kaneko-san. Thank you very much. And uh, what an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm just going to give you a short presentation and um, hopefully we can have some time for a uh, question and answer. Okay, so um, I... I I, uh, like uh, Kanzaki-sensei, uh, Professor Kanzaki, am a forest ecologist, though I am <laughs> not in his same class. He is one of the greatest uh, forest ecologists in Asia, it, in the tropics, really, and has worked in every, uh, every imaginable tropical forest type uh, in the region, more so than I think than any other researcher uh, working today. I work on a much smaller scale in Singapore, but I'm, what, what I'd like to do is, is the following. I'd like to talk about, just start with Singapore and then go to the region and highlight some of the challenges and needs. Unlike uh, uh, Dr. Putra, Pro Professor Putra, I, I don't in, uh, engage in actual derivation of, of uh, useful compounds or, or pharmaceuticals from, from, um, from nature, but I do see that as a, as a great opportunity and one of the ways that we can ensure that people like Professor Putra and others can continue to do their work is to really hold the line against the biodiversity loss. So I think that'll be my that'll be my um, main theme today. What are, what are some of the opportunities in, in terms of in terms of protecting biodiversity and ensuring that we can get the products and services that we need, uh, as was so uh, so expertly shared by Professor Kanzaki and also by Professor Putra. Um, most of you know Singapore. I mean, most of you watching are based here. And obviously, we, we are, think of ourselves as a very urban place, but not just an urban place. It's a very green urban place, a, a, a garden city. Now, with the garden city, it was an interesting thing because, uh, as, as, as you know, Singapore is a very unlikely country. It was never intended to be a country until 1965 when it was suddenly found itself having to be a country after, after being shown the exit door from the, from the Federated States of Malaysia. Sorry, Dr. Lam, would you yes. be able to uh, put your slides to full screen? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. No worries about that. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you. I hope that's better. Sorry. Um, what? Thank you. Thank you very much. What I wanted to say about this Garden City is that it actually wasn't a um, accident. It was a very deliberate attempt to show that Singapore could be had the organizational capacity and the vision to make this place a livable 
country, not only livable, but worth investing in that had a, a bright future and that if it could maintain its greenery, that was just kind of an outward sign that Singapore knew how to manage its uh, much more than just greenery, both its systems as well as its um, many different environmental, uh, economic, and uh, other challenges. So again, the architect of the green city was the first prime minister of an independent Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Um, again, it was very strategic, very, very strategic. And we went from a garden city, you know, here's Mr. Lee planting trees through the years, um, to being a city in a garden, you know, and again, anywhere you go in the city, you'll see sort of tree-lined streets, um, which, which residents and visitors alike appreciate. And uh, again, this is a, we went from a garden city to a city in a garden. It's not just words. I think it, it also was reflected in a kind of a philosophy and manifested in the way we, the way we green this city and, and make greenery part of people's lives. Um, and then we've gone from a city in a garden to now we're a city in nature. Now, if you look at nature in Singapore, and Professor Kanzaki had already mentioned the rich diversity in this very small island country of 700 square kilo kilometers. Um, there's over 300 bird species, 300 butterfly species. We have 2,000 species of plants. One third of the world's hard corals just in the reefs around Singapore shores. So maybe uh, pro uh, Professor <laughs> Putra, you can come <laughs> collaborate with some colleagues here in Singapore also. Um, not as rich, of course, as Indonesia, but qu quite surprisingly rich given the small size of the island. Um, here are some of the interesting uh, wildlife that we have from the globally critically endangered straw-headed bulbul at the lower right-hand corner. We've got woodpeckers, bee eaters, that's the hill mina, an indicator of, of, of good forest. Uh, we have the kalugo, uh, very common in Singapore. It's a gliding mammal, which you can see uh, quite often in our nature reserves and parks. Um, again, that golden royal is a rare butterfly, uh, one of the th over 300 native species. And of course, we have things like the Sunda pangolin, globally critically endangered, but currently um, uh, found in most of our forests in Singapore. Uh, this is hunted relentlessly for its scales, for traditional, for use in traditional medicine, and also for its flesh. Um, a very adorable creature, uh, sadly, um, s set to disappear through much or most of its range. Um, here's another, not from Singapore, maybe once was found in Singapore, but certainly in the forests of the Sunda region. This is the critically endangered helmeted hornbill. It has, unlike other birds, not a hollow, but a solid cask, this, this, this part of just above the head and, and the bill. This is often used as a um, substitute for elephant ivory, the trade of which is banned. And this bird went from being classified as vulnerable to critically endangered in just, in just a few years because of the, again, the poaching, the illegal hunting um, of this of this ecologically very important species, some may argue, you know, that we can get products and ecosystem services f from nature, but also others will argue that maybe nature alone, you know, just has a right to exist. It has an intrinsic value, and maybe we can talk about some of this during the Q and A session. Unfortunately, uh, partly because of the population of this region and and the and the the wealth and the hunger for, for many of the products that are successfully produced here, such as um, palm oil or, or rubber or many other crops, um, these forests are under threat. And um, if, you, if you look at forests of Southeast Asia, much of the lowland forest is, is, is gone or going. Take a look, for example, at Sumatra, Java, uh, parts of Borneo, um, tremendous forest loss, tremendous forest loss. And Interestingly, this, this analysis, and let me get my notes here, this analysis paints two uh, scenarios, a worst case, worst case and a best case, and um, there's a possibility that this forest will further shrink in the worst case scenario and give off over 790 million tons of carbon emissions, but under a best case scenario, this forest could possibly um, this forest loss could be reversed 
And that's what I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. Now, one other habitat I'd like to focus on, what's called peat swamps. So if you look at peat swamps, they are found on low-lying areas throughout the Sunda region, the whole east coast of Sumatra, and, and much of so, uh, southern, uh, western Borne, uh, Kalimantan, and also the state of Sarawak in eastern Malaysia. These peat forests are incredible. They're very beautiful and interesting. This is a uh, peat forest in uh, Brunei. Uh, and, and again, you can see this canopy stretching forever. But what, what's interesting about these forests are they're on swampy ground. And th there it is, it is a magnificent habitat. But interestingly also, this forest does not grow on normal mineral-based soil. It actually is grown on organic. I mean, they call it peat. It's just the accumulated over thousands of years, leaves, branches, twigs, um, incredible, incredible ecosystem. And it's found throughout, again, much of the Eastern coast of Sumatra and much of the coastal regions of Borneo, these two great Sunda islands. If we look, for example, though, uh, so pay it, I, I'd like to point out the peat forest, which is this swamp. It's the light green color. If you look at, say, 100 years ago in Sumatra to maybe 30 years ago in Sumatra, you notice also the, the rain, rainforest, the, the dark green is disappearing as well. But if you look recently, the peat has been almost completely cleared and this is this is worrying not because it's just a loss of habitat and biodiversity because this peat swamp uh, soil is not mineral based it's organic which means it eventually will if if drained and that's how that's how they cultivate uh, oil palm oil palm on it if drained it the organics will eventually degrade and return back to the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide. So it's a huge, huge source of, of carbon emissions, which is very bad for all of us. And if you look at where we need to be, and I guess I think everyone knows this, to, to really we need to be at, we need to half our, in order to really keep life on our planet as we know it, we need to half our carbon emissions uh, by 2030 and almost go to net zero carbon emissions, net zero carbon, well, in 30 years time or so, that's not much time. That's as long as I've lived in uh, Southeast Asia and in 30 years we went from having forests and peat swamps all over to the last remaining uh, pieces of it. And again, uh, if you look at just forest fires from the region, you can see that the emissions, the emissions are incredible. Now, just to put this in perspective, if you look just in the year 2015, the emissions from fires in the region exceeded, exceeded the carbon emissions of many countries just from fires. This is not, not even the, you know, the through uh, industrial or domestic um, use, it's just from fires alone. And so, there is this huge need and an opportunity, I believe, a need to restore these habitats, to stabilize not only regional but global climates, to absorb carbon. But unfortunately, the, the, the scale is so huge. The labor is great. Just to restore a small piece of forest requires a lot of effort, clearing a site, planting the trees, keeping the weeds away, uh, monitoring, preventing fires. And these are just for small areas. Imagine we're talking about hundreds or thousands of, 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 of hectares, tens of thousands of hectares um, that need restoration, monitoring, fire prevention. We need to give people involved in these projects sustainable livelihoods. Um, so lots of great challenges. One other area though I'd like to point out are the seas. And again, Professor Putra is the expert, but uh, as you know, I mean, these are these uh, warming sea. I think this is a 2015 um, El Nino event. So the dark red is just higher temperatures. And you can see in the uh, Pacific, this belt of warm water uh, spreading and moving with a great probability of coral loss from this. Because what happens, as you most of you know, corals bleach, they, they eject the algae, which helps keep them alive. Uh, if they're subjected to too much warming. And eventually, if you have prolonged bleaching, the corals eventually die. So what could be a very rich, sustainable, um, productive ecosystem can collapse 
at least as, as we know it. And again, um, not just coral reefs, but just fisheries. We have some of the richest fisheries on the planet, but unfortunately poorly regulated, poorly monitored, and, and just over overfishing uh, from this tremendous demand has led to a near collapse of many of our, our fisheries. And again, there is this potential, not potential, this need to reverse this trend. So these are, these are very kind of traditional things, forests, peat swamps, uh, coral reefs, fisheries. However, what's really interesting is that we need them to be sustainably managed and, and, and supplemented by high-tech, high-yield aquaculture that's sustainable. This is uh, my favorite fish market, but look at, look at the huge volumes of fish with voracious appetites for it in, in Asia. Now, um, the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to say and, and open it up for discussion that many people talk of what's called the you know, green recovery. The European Union have a, uh, have a green deal that incorporates restoration of, of ecosystems and stabilizing and reversing ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss as part of their sustained long-term vision of a, of a economy that's fair, uh, equitable, sustainable and and distributes benefits not just to people but to, but to nature so here's the last slide that i'd like to show this is great need as i said to to not ju not just for biodiversity but because of the services that these ecosystems provide to restore these to reverse that biodiversity loss to increase the sequestration of carbon we could potentially lose over 700 million tons of carbon from forests over the next decade or two, but we can potentially reverse this and increase the amount of stored carbon by twice that amount if we act quickly, but we cannot, using current methods, restore these habitats quickly enough. I think we need to really combine the best of traditional ecology uh, along with, sorry, that's a typo on policy, we will need to use deep technology to monitor, to develop, to develop new approaches to healing e damaged ecosystems, to provide livelihoods for all the people who'll be involved from everybody on the tech side of things to people working on the ground. And I think there's this great potential for these very meaningful collaborations that will not only restore nature, but will restore uh, livelihoods, good livelihoods, create opportunities, and in the end, really provide the stabilizing services that are vital to survival. Again, not just of nature, but people as well. And if we can manage to do this, then people like Professor Kanzaki and Professor Putra can continue to do their research and bring uh, life-saving products from nature's pantry uh, to us. Uh, again, I wanna thank uh, SG Innovate and JST for inviting me, and I'm happy to have a discussion. And for this, I, I'd also like to invite uh, Professor Putra and Professor Kanzaki to help answer any questions because you are definitely experts on these habitats as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sean, for your very enlightening presentation. Now I uh, invite you to answer the questions we see in the Q&A box. Uh, we probably have a few minutes for you to answer all this. So the first one goes, Singapore is a green city, but as compared to Japan or uh, European countries where we, uh, the, the questionnaire has lived in for many years, we do not incubate recycling habit that much. For example, the questionnaire is always the only person who throw the plastic and paper garbage in the recycle bin provided uh, at their basement. So, is there any more effort to mobilize more of this mindset and activities in such a green city in light of biodiversity economy? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shirley, for the question. And again, if, if, if my other panelists would like to help answer, I'm, uh, please uh, turn on your microphones and contribute. The, there's, I think this very interesting, um, in, in my experience, because I work in you know nature conservation as well, I find that some of us in the nature in the biodiversity community often don't engage people in say the the brown sectors of the environment, such as uh, resource use, recycling, um, uh, 
uh, waste management and so on. And I think it's time we, we combine forces really to show that there is this kind of integrated need to protect our uh, environment to, and to lead greener lives. Again, greener lives that not only stretch the amount of resources available, but really provide livelihoods and, and social and economic uh, equity uh, to people as well. I think this is going to have to come from a combination of work on the ground by volunteer groups and civil society, uh, educational institutions, as well as policy that comes from from above and it needs to be an integrated approach. And you're absolutely right. And if we can do this, we can also then make our lifestyles a lot more sustainable through a kind of a responsible and enlightened consumerism. Okay, thank you for that. So let us quickly move on to the second question. Uh, from uh, Hui Ying. So we have so much biodiversity in Singapore. How to bring more awareness and appreciation in Singapore and create more uh, conservation effort? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, Hui Ying, I wish I knew. If I knew, you know, we'd be, have the problem. Part. But, you know, it's a very good question. And I think it's interesting. In the, say, unlike Japan or Indonesia, you can actually, you know, if you go to Japan or Indonesia, you, your food and all the resources that you get, you can trace them to their source. Uh, you can go from a city to a rural countryside and to see what a sustainable lifestyle is. And we just have everything coming to us into the stores. And, and I think this kind of exposure, uh, opening our minds and also our hearts to understand that there is this broader connection. We are connected to the living world and how we can do that again, it's going to take this great effort. But, you know, in Japan, there is this concept of satoyama. I mean, or it's, I mean it's, it's not just a concept, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, this kind of uh, nature and humans for mutual benefit because, you know, using resources sustainably. I think we need to have that sort of mentality somehow uh, in rural, I mean, sort of urban areas, not just in Singapore, but, but really everywhere, you know, but at least we can see trees and, and trees, maybe that's the first sort of crack to kind of open our hearts to nature a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one from Daniele, with the abundance potential in the forests and oceans in Southeast Asia, how do we get the government to see the necessity to conserve and ethically sustain these ecosystems for uh, eco economy? Yes, uh, well, I see a note here. Prof uh, Kanzak Sensei, oh. did you want to answer this no, question? She, she canceled it. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, okay. Oh, no, you would be much better to I do see. this. <laughs> no, no. Um, this is really, again, interesting. It could be that we reach what are called tipping points. Right now, maybe awareness is, is low, but as it slowly builds momentum, there'll be this moment where all of a sudden we all look around and say, wait a minute, you know, we can do things better and more sustainably. I'm hoping we can do that, but we can't, um, we can't let chance to, you know, take us there. We really need to strategize. And, um, and it's gonna be coming from the ground, from the civil society. And I think the private sector can really push this a lot because once we see the, the value, the value add of nature, I think policymakers take notice. They certainly look at deep tech uh, with a lot more seriousness they, than say a, a, a ecologist like me. Uh, to be honest, and you know, not to be sycophantic or anything like that. Okay, we have two more questions that uh, which uh, we can quickly answer. So, from the person Pu Tun Huan, what do you think uh, the opportunities of existing forest restoration and forest based livelihood in Singapore? Yes, th thank you, thank you, Mr. Po. Oh, po. Um, I think Singapore can be, you know, in the same way, like say uh, Tokyo or Tsukuba or Kyoto can, can be kind of these uh, testing beds for new technology and, and approaches. Um, Singapore can also, we have forests, we have, uh, um, we have a forest restoration program. I think what we could do is really to combine the best of ecology with technology uh, and maybe, a, and to develop sustainable business models that could, re, you know, if we can make this work in Singapore or Kyoto, we can scale this up. I mean, and the opportunities really are gonna be in the region because there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of square kilometers that need restoration, not just because, you know, we wanna create habitats for birds and everything, but these provide the services, climate stabilization, you know, carbon uh, absorption and so on. And again, if, if, if Professor Kanzaki or uh, 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 Professor Putra want to jump in, please do, please do. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, this, this is a quite a diff, difficult question, I think. But the private sector is quite important. Just a policy is not in, uh, enough. Right? So the, our society based on money also. So the monetary based change is necessary. So how to invite the private sector? I, I, yeah, actually in Japan, now many private sector interested in the CSR activity. Uh, cooperation uh, social responsibility and uh, this is now quite important uh, point in Japan society so I think that every country can change from now in Japan also we change very gradually and I think slow start uh, comparing to the Germany or other countries but anyway we are now changing I believe so uh, Singapore is also, uh, I think, a small country, so uh, a bit easy to change, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Uh, no, no, it's okay for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So one last question for Dr. Shan. Uh, where are the endangered species coming from? When people see the endangered species in Singapore's green park, are they looking at captive bred or wild caught species? Oh, th thank you, thank you. So this is very interesting. Some some of these uh, endangered species that we see, in fact, are possibly escapees. But what? But much of what we see, it, because people in Singapore, for the most part, forgot how to hunt as we quickly urbanized and lost that sort of rural tradition. People actually stopped hunting, and the few things that were still here, such as the pangolin, managed to. To recover, same with mouse deer and other amazing things, and you know maybe there is an answer here, which is if we can provide um, just not just you know stopping hunting, but but we we create an awareness and appreciation, like many of you on the Q and A um, box have mentioned, it's it's really about changing an outlook, changing an outlook, and and changing our perception of nature, but that has to be also turned into a value proposition for, for business and enterprise as well. I believe we can do that. We've seen great examples of it today, but to scale these up, not just, again, to benefit nature, but what benefits nature is also beneficial to us. And that, that's the amazing thing. And I think it's going to have to come with, with people from the tech sector, without which we really cannot come up with these solutions to our crisis of, of uh, ecology and, and, and biodiversity. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shine and all the thank speakers. Uh, I think this marks the end of this seminar. So I, now now I'd like to pass on to Jay Wing from uh, SG Innovate to announce, um, uh, say her closing remarks. Yep. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Fukuhara, Professor Kanzaki, Dr. Mastera, and Dr. Lam for your insightful presentations and Annie for your great moderation. And of course, thank you to all attendees for your time and questions.